Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single short story at a time. Story Talk is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our Patreon page or by going to our website, oneweekcritique.com. I'm Ingrid Wenzler, here today with Matthew Schmidt. Hello. And Adam Alcerghani. Howdy. Today we'll be discussing new Pocahontas from Jonathan Blum's collection, The Usual Uncertainties, published by Rescue Press in 2019. Jonathan Blum is also featured in our interview series. For more insight into his writing process and how he approaches revision in particular, please see our website. New Pocahontas, the story will take as our focus today, is told in retrospect. The story's main characters live together for a short time in a divided Victorian mansion in Napa Valley. Those characters are Alexander M. Culver, the absentee landlord of the mansion and other quasi-dilapidated properties similar to it, Uzio, a fanciful live-in property manager from a nearby town, who's in his mid-twenties, a bodybuilder, bicycle enthusiast, enthusiast, and aspiring computer programmer of Greek descent. Xiao Mei and her Daisy and Stone, and the narrator himself, who's 35 and who moved from Berkeley to the mansion after his mother passed away. Xiao Mei has left an abusive boyfriend under the care of Mr. Culver. Culver becomes enamored, enamored with her, and she's the only woman. Sorry, uh, she's the only woman, and he tends to have many who inspires him to stay at his mansion, not just for the weekend but beyond Monday morning. He wines and dines, Shell May and Napa. The narrator is asked to babysit and does. But then Mr. Culver disappears for nearly three weeks, leaving Shell May and her children to stay in his apartment. When he returns, things aren't as he's left them. Uziel and Xiaomei have become inseparable. Culver's return disrupts the tranquil tranquility the house has come to know. Xiaomei leaves with the children, and here I'll spoil part of the story's ending. The next we hear of her, she's been murdered by her abusive boyfriend, who she returned to. Culver reaches out to the narrator and then Uziel about her death, and encounters again Uziel at the funeral. After that, the residents within the house, including two chefs who I haven't mentioned yet, disband. There's more to the action, but let's try starting here. This story takes what I and I think many other readers, writers, and educators have come to shorthand as the Gatsby approach to narration. The narrator spends more time on other characters, relaying their stories and describing their decisions and behaviors than he does on his own. Let's talk a little bit about the narrator, what we know about him and his background and why, as far as we know and can reasonably guess, he's chosen to tell this story. Uh, well, his name is Gregory and he is from Iowa, Pocahontas, Iowa. All right. Which is where we're based. Okay, not Pocahontas, but in Iowa. Uh, and he has lived in LA before and his mother, has just died recently and he's been looking to start over in some fashion. He doesn't really tell us what that fashion is uh, on the surface, but you know, one of the things is his mother has been an issue in the family in the past. Uh, it seems from drinking, drug abuse, things of that nature. Uh, and would disappear from time to time. And he wouldn't see her for a long time. And the family, uh, which he has several sisters, uh, they help his mother uh, when she is sick with the medical bills, charging them on their credit cards. 
Uh, she seems to settle down after this and moves in with a friend, but then has uh, a brain hemorrhage and dies shortly thereafter. So I think, you know, the one thing we're trying to figure out is <clears throat> why exactly does he move to Napa Valley in this particular house? And what is it he wants? He does tell us he wants to set down roots. He doesn't exactly specify what those roots are. And it's unclear whether he actually knows himself what he wants. Uh, but I think he's chosen to tell the story because it's a major turning point in his life. His mother no longer lingers in his mind. He doesn't have to wonder where she is, what she's doing, if she's all right. Uh, but also uh, earlier in the story, he's mentioned that he is an uncle 11 times over. So his sisters have been having lots of babies uh, and this particular move coincides with Zhao Mei and what happens with her. Uh, and he does become close with Zhao Mei's children, Stone and Daisy. And so I think that kind of uh, works into what is important to him. And, you know, I get the sense that either he is closeted uh, or outrightly gay. Uh, we can certainly talk about that, but I get that sense because he mentions that the O'Connells, I believe, which is his family's name, uh, produce a lot of offspring. If he doesn't have any children, right, uh, that points to either he's not trying to have children, he doesn't want children um, of his own, or perhaps he is gay. And I think there are some other things that point to that within this story. Um, but that is one thing that I kept thinking was true as I read the story. Um, and he eventually does find a way of living that perhaps he likes. Uh, and we'll probably talk about that later. Uh, but that's kind of the situation in general when we begin. Yeah, I think that that's a pretty good summary of the scene. So rather than um, over elaborate on the details of the narrator, um, I'd say that Right, to the homosexuality thing, certainly this story is wide ranging. Um, the main focus is about this briefish period in the narrator's life wherein he lives in this Victorian house, but it, um, it really focuses on uh, romantic relationship issues, right? Uh, the, uh, the, cuisines, uh, the epicures, if you will, uh, they both get married at random within the context of the story, at random in the sense that they have a surprise dinner party wedding. Uh, I, Uziel is a, forgive me if I'm saying that name wrong, I've looked it up and listened to it and I haven't quite gotten it uh, under my tongue. Um, but Uziel, right, we hear, um, has this sort of uh, preternatural uh, ability to attract females. Um, there are literally just women watching him uh, while he's doing chores around the house. Uh, but he's also bringing home this sort of, uh, for lack of a better metaphor, like train of women in and out that the narrator is sort of listening to him have sex with. Um, you know, obviously, Jaume has this, um, you know, she's got an ex-husband and the abusive boyfriend, and we don't really get a full story on the relationship between her and Uziel or her and the landlord, um, but she um, is a romantic interest, regardless of what her romantic interest is in other people. Um, she gets very preoccupied with her own daughter's attraction to the narrator. Um, 
at a dinner party and gets really sort of problematically vocal about it. Um, and I think that that's, um, right, like the narrators are worrying out these various things, right, including at the end, one of the individuals he thinks about has an imaginary boyfriend um, who that artist uh, refers to when <laughs> Uh, reading applications, um, but we'll get into all that more a bit later. I think he's also, right, like he's reflecting, there's something about the story and about this narrator that is very Nick Carraway, um, and that he's not only remembering a time and sort of telling us about that time, um, remembering a space and telling us about that space, remembering the magic and strangeness of that space and observing other people's romantic life. Um, but he's also, uh, I think, trying to derive from that something about the sort of meaning of his life. Um, and I guess the other thing that I'd like to mention about that narrator is while he's doing that, he has a lot of time to observe in this space, in part because he is the, uh, maybe the OG WFH. He's, uh, he's working from home uh, well before uh, pandemic days, and we don't really know what his job is, but he does let us know that. And it's part of why he has time to hang out with Xiao Mei's kids and be so preoccupied watching the manager of the house and observing all these little details. But whatever that job is, keeps him at home, but also doesn't uh, disrupt him from a little bit of snoopery, honestly. <laughs> like so, uh, whoever he's telling the story to and wherever he is now, and we don't know either of those things from the story per se, um, although maybe the two of you have some insights. He's um, he definitely is uh, sharing some pretty intimate stuff, um, but that's my that's my little insight. Yeah, I I like it that you describe the story as wide ranging. I think it is in terms of the the amount of time it covers. Um, I mean, Matthew, you spent some time on the mother and. Um, I think in a way, like the treatment of the mother is one of the things that impresses me most about the story that she's at her death and, you know, um, her character is so much in the background, but is so formative to, to the story and how it gets told in a way Like it's, I, I don't know, I guess I, I just like that. Um, one thing I admire about um, the collection that the stories featured featured in the usual uncertainties is um, how much its style, its narrative voice, and its characters change story to story. Um, I think the co the collection is very cohesive, but also very wide ranging stylistically. Um, it's an agile collection. It's quick on its feet. Um, this story for me calls to mind um, Heinrich Buhl, who we featured in Story Talk. Um, and in certain respects, all of Salinger's work for me. Um, where another story, um, one that I think you two would love, incidentally, um, Roger's Square Dance Bar Mitzvah, um, really reminds me of Barry Hanna. Um, so I think especially because um, I'd encourage listeners to check out the collection as a whole. Um, I'm curious about like, what defines this story stylistically for the two of you um, and what you two are noticing at the sentence level. Yeah, I actually um, wanted to read the first paragraph of this story. Um, and I feel like this is a good opportunity to do it. Um, so, quote, at the time this story takes place, I was living in a two-room apartment with odd-angled ceilings on the top floor of a divided Victorian mansion in the town of Napa. Some months earlier, just after my mother reappeared for the very last time, in fact, I had visited the town with a friend, seen the house on a quiet street called Kite Street near the river, 
and said to my friend, I must live in that house. I was always adding to my list of reasons to leave Berkeley. When I came back several months later to look at the available apartment, it was early March and the weathered house with a complex of scaffolding along one side seemed on the verge of a renaissance. At the very least, someone was about to do quite a bit of painting here. The mossy gables, the exalted peeling cornices and pale shingled walls, the quiet inclining street near the river, all gave the house the appearance of being a kind of calm, glorious creature, comfortably set on the land, ambivalent about drawing attention to itself. The house brought me to it in many ways. I can hardly express. I had recently turned 35. My mother had just died. Uh, end quote. <laughs> I also added in many ways. It brought me to it in ways. Um, but I, I wanted to read that both because it's a pretty incredible first paragraph. Um, rarely does it work when someone says at the top of a story, this story takes place or in this story. Um, but he's announcing that he is a storyteller, right? In the sense that like, and now we're in this space, like welcome to the room, right? Uh, very much in the way that musicians will often just like begin the music, right? Without introducing the band. They're, they're offering you the environment to be in and they're asking you to listen. I also think this first paragraph is indicative of a couple things the story is gonna do throughout. Um, one is that it is going to share several things. We're going to focus on the house, but we're going to get information about the background and the sort of occasion for the story in the sense of the things that the narrator's working through, right? The desire to leave Berkeley, though we don't know why, the sort of troubling relationship to the mother and the dealing with the grief of the mother's death, that we don't know much about it yet. Um, and then the details of the house. Um, two things strike me immediately when reading this work. One is the sort of hyper, um, uh, the hyper formal sense that's achieved by using a lot of prepositional phrases, right? With odd angled ceilings on the top floor of a divided Victorian mansion in the town of Napa, right? Um, it's a slightly unusual, slightly formal way of phrasing all of that, right? Um, it also puts a lot more into the sentences um, and extends those sentences by adding detail on detail, preposition on preposition, which is amplified even more by the fact that the narrator um, and the writer has used a sort of hypotactic style, meaning that the sentences are broken up um, and extended beyond just subject, predicate, and that we get insertions, right? Um, not only the aside, M dashed out just after, right? Some months earlier, M dashed just after my mother reappeared for the very last time, but we also get the the vocalization of, in fact, right? Um, which also infers something about how the conversation is gonna go, right? At the time the story takes place, it's being told formally, but then we're getting those like, in facts that, I mean, it reminds me very much if you ever go see a storyteller, right? Like how Hallbrook doing Mark Twain is sort of the classic one, but like where um, it's a formal setting for the storytelling, but the intimacy is created through those moments of voice, um, even against the, the written out language. Um, yeah, I, it is like a direct address to someone, except that it feels like no one is right there. Or if someone is right there, it's not just one person. Yeah. Right. It feels like either like telling a dinner party or telling an audience this is what I remember. This is what happens. This is why it's important. And, you know, I think as the narrator, 
the narrator knows that they have this need to be very specific um, and wants to describe this in kind of flowery language uh, insofar as we're not we're not going deep into the dictionary, but we're going past like <laughs> we're going past the the surface of the dictionary, no doubt about it. Uh, because of that, you know, specificity and formality uh, that Adam has talked about. And the narrator also knows that because this is something they do all the time, they have to rein themselves in sometimes. So like if you notice at the end of that paragraph, We've got two really short sentences. I had recently turned 35. My mother had just died. It, it's as if the narrator's like, oh, I need to like move on. <laughs> I need to like get to the, what's important. Uh, but, you know, here's a little like taster for like what's to come. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, Adam covered most of the things uh, that I was thinking about talking about. Uh, the only other thing is, is that I think a lot of this story comes uh, in exposition. Uh, there, there is dialogue, and at times a lot of dialogue. But for a fairly long story, there are a lot of big paragraphs, long paragraphs, uh, just so the reader gets a sense of what it looks like on the page. Yeah, I'm glad that the two of you picked up on all that. I mean, I think um, it is absolutely the story within the collection, um, the most highly tactical sentences that, you know, leans into description the most. There are other stories that are truly voice-driven um, and others that are much more spare. Um, I do notice, Matthew, um, you know how you picked up on the shorter sentences at the end, but now and then Blum will use that in totally different contexts um, for humor, um, you know, explain something in a very specific way and then kind of say like, at the very least, quite a lot of painting was about to get done here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, that's something to look for in the usual uncertainties. Um, so I'm, I'm also glad that you two brought up the house. Um, it interests me and I, I don't know, honestly, if that's because it reminds me of places I've known. Um, a Victorian house I lived in for about six years as a child and my mom obsessively trying out different colors on that house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, um, you know, the slanted ceilings of my bedroom in high school or one of my sister's apartments in Providence. I feel like I've lived around these kinds of houses a lot. Um, and they've been kind of special to me. So, you know, it was something I paid attention to. And I find in this story, as the house gets described and worked on and talked about in the story, that um, it's remarkably visually potent. Um, I imagine it, I have a real idea of it. Um, and I guess I wondered partly because I know that I've lived around these houses a lot, if that's true for you also. and if you think of the house as important to the story and um, if so, in what ways? Well, I think I agree with you in part that I know what the house looks like. I think I know certain parts of the house better than other parts, meaning like the entryway, the foyer, uh, the narrator's room, like those are very clear to me. And then the grounds to some extent. And I feel like I know the outside of the house as well. But I maybe have less of an inkling of, say, Mr. Culver's room or Uziel's room. Uh, only because we don't spend a lot of time in there because the narrator doesn't spend a lot of time in there. So to me, that makes sense, right? Um, I, I would say, yes, I think the house is important. And I think it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, when I think of Victorian houses, I don't generally think of them being in California. And so this is an interesting thing 
insofar as it's not a single family living in this big mansion. Uh, and it's interesting that Mr. Calvers bought this and has, you know, split it up into several rooms that are rented. And so like, it does like give you that kind of California vibe of, you know, kind of anything goes or, or like a bit more laid back than say, uh, the Northeast, for example, where I picture more Victorian houses or say the, uh, Southeast, uh, where I picture a different type of Victorian house. So, you know, in those ways, I think it does say something about the time in which this takes place. And I'm not certain exactly what time it takes place, but it's got to be uh, early to mid 90s to perhaps early 2000s. And I say that because of the references that take place, uh, especially Beauty and the Beast, which Daisy is very fond of, uh, in which Gregory Stone and Daisy go view at one point. Uh, there's also mention of Arsenio Hall, Ice Cube, uh, you know, different things like that. So we have some, some markers. And, you know, I, I think this, this house also is open to any type of person. Right, we've got a homosexual uh, baker, a homosexual chef that are both women. We have Uzio, who is uh, of Greek descent, and his father uh, produces olives, among other things. And we have Gregory, who is from Iowa. Uh, so a transplant of sorts. And they are painting the outside of the house 21 different colors. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. Because <laughs> Mr. Culver has this book about restoring, restoring Victorian houses. And one of the things, one of the chapters in the book details how, how to do so. And so Uzil, uh, who wants to repair this house, is using Mr. Culver's book to do so. And on the other hand, Mr. Culver doesn't want to spend any money. He wants all the glamor with none of the cost of showing off places that he owns. And so that, you know, that tension uh, continues throughout the story between those two characters. But, you know, this is like, instead of being a few people in a fairly large dwelling that might have several servants, right? We have a different mix of people inhabiting this large house that intermingle and make this particularly interesting, especially when Zhao Mei appears with her two children, right? What happens after that is a strange mix of childish things. Uh, the, uh, the cooking that is done sometimes on Tuesday nights and dinner parties, uh, the repair that Uzil does, as well as his exploits and exercise. And then the strange narrator, Gregory, who we're not certain what exactly he does, but who likes children, expects children to like him, but does not expect anyone else to like him. Yeah, um, all of that. Um, I do feel like I know this kind of house, uh, both because, right, like Victorian houses had a life after Queen Victoria died. Um, and right, like it's a popular form and sort of a, it becomes a sort of nouveau riche form after a while. And so I, you know, I went to school in Galesburg, Illinois for a while. And uh, right, it's a town of, a, you know, 
a bunch of dilapidated <laughs> uh, late age Victorian homes. And I've been through Napa Valley and I a number of times I had an uncle who lived uh, not too far who liked to take people, you know, wine tasting up through that uh, area. And there are big weird houses like this. And I think to Matthew's point, the time period in which this story takes place is actually pretty important in part because the time in which this kind of house was um, viable as a place for a bunch of weird folk to come in and thrive is really critical. Um, and also, right, like there's something about this story that reads, you know, I was telling Matthew earlier, it reads a little like a strange version of Joy Williams, um, who we just did a story talk on, except um, uh, as my uncle used to say, California is the, the land of fruit and nuts and uh, there's something very kind of fruity and nutty about this particular space and having that like be possible for um, folks from a lot of different backgrounds um, is one thing but also the preoccupation right it's not just that Uziel is Greek and his like father grows olives right it's the preoccupation with that and I think the house um, in that kind of, you know, nouveau riche way has this sensibility, right? This narrator wants to recreate a kind of Victorian way of speaking that hypotactic like style um, while it's got a much more modern sense of humor, right? Like there is that that hard tendency of England at a particular time to use all of the iambic like prepositional phrases you can possibly link together. Um, there is a, I looked this up and I've already forgotten how to say it, right? Like the desire to say things like, right? A strawberry cloth routine slathered with whipped cream, you know? <laughs> um, and I think the, the house is that and that it's the occasion and I think Part of that also to Matthew's point is that even Gregory's room, I mean, we see snippets of it because he has conversations there. We do get descriptions of it, but it's not a, you know, a wildly described room or set of rooms. And um, likewise, right, we see the, the sort of architectural fascination with the house more than we see the sort of nuances of the house, right? Like I briefly lived in a Victorian house once and what I remember most is not the ceilings. It's the, it was the first house I had like a, one of those crappy like old heaters in that just used to suck all the air out in a Midwestern winter that's already too dry. And then like spit too much like moisture back into the air somehow. It was very like, aggravating is like um that you got to get close to it and be humid or get far away from it and just feel your lips chap um and i think that there's something about the house and the way in which it's that palette that everything happens in that um is informative about the way the narrator thinks uh the way the narrator thinks about that time and the fact that in some ways this is a house for the folks who are in the house, living in the house and the gossip of the house more than it is a house for living in per se, which is I think part of the title, right? Like the, the new Pocahontas is a, a place like the old Pocahontas in which you would not want to live and you would want to run away from in some way. Um, Yeah, um, I, I'm glad that you spoke a little bit about that because, um, you know, one thing I didn't say that I that I might have said um, is that I've never been to Napa Valley, so um, you know, taking me there through the house, um, 
was was really useful as a reader. Um, I felt like I could imagine it. Um, but you know, to Matthew's point, like I don't, I don't know that I have the whole layout in my head. Not every room. It's more that I have a sense of like the feel of the space and. Um, I, I do start to imagine Napa Valley for myself a little bit kind of based on the house. Um, it's, it's character, but also, um, you know, it's a particular kind of house that calls to you and makes you want to live in it. And um, I think with this house, it seems to me that it's as much kind of to your point, Adam, about um, you know, the, the charm of the house itself, but also the kinds of people that it draws, mm. the community that it welcomes. Um, so speaking of that community, um, bad transition, but um, <laughs> our, our Culver and Uziel, whose name I'm also not sure that I'm pronouncing right, I, I forgot to look this one up. Um, are they foils, do you think? And how would you describe their different ways of loving and losing Shalmay? Yeah, I mean, one reason I said that um, this the, this period in Napa Valley was, it's not impossible, but it still happens. Some of it, uh, what I'm alluding to is the Napa Valley is a very expensive place to live now. Mm -hmm. um, you need to visit. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that, right, some of that's already there, right? Zeal has this possibility of sort of living in this space as someone who's passionate about the house um, to your foil point and something of a contrast, right? Like Culver's book um, about restoring Victorian houses is literally sort of on a pedestal, right? Um, and and presumably there's something that they, there's a meeting point there, but the way in which that's engaged with Culver, it's, you know, the, the sort of women he brings to the house, the way he interacts with the house, his indifference to the space, um, right? There's something a little more, I don't know, capitalist and, and pristine um, or, you know, disnified. Um, to use a more negative term about the way he interacts um, with the home. Um, we don't get the full story as to why. Maybe he owns 50 Victorian houses and he just rolls around between all of them. Right? We don't really know um, all of what he gets up to. Um, in Uziel, right, like this is his space and he's living this kind of uh, drifty, 20 something life of bodybuilding and taking care of this one space that's sort of become his passion and um, floating amongst various women and um, so on and so forth, right? So, in that way, right, like I think, right, like Uziel, um, Uziel is kind of dealing with what's in front of him and Culver's always sort of crafting what he wants you to see of him. Uziel is sort of focusing on the space in front of him and a vision of what it is. Um, Culver's always sort of telling you what the vision is, including, right? Like he comes up and just sort of tells Gregory that he's going to be babysitting Yu Xiaomei's children, <laughs> um, among other things. I, I don't know if I think them as, of them as the sort of like classic version of what we mean when we say foils um, in that like they aren't, they aren't polar opposites. They aren't necessarily representations of uh, absolute contrast. I think in some ways they're a partnership that is divided by the mutual affection for this woman, um, but because we have that kind of Gregory is the Nick Carraway sort of figure, and because as a special kind of Nick Carraway, Gregory doesn't have the sort of 
insight into the backstory, right? The story doesn't have the moment that Gatsby has where you get the real story of Gatsby becoming a bootlegger. Um, and in that way, right, like there's, there's something sort of um, incomplete about how we understand the competition that develops between them. And we have to view it through the lens or I feel as though I have to view it through the lens of what Gregory can tell me. And he's telling me a lot of presumptive things, right? Like, um, let me give you an example of that, right? Like that Gregory doesn't hear about what happens at the funeral or how the two men encounter each other or see each other. Um, intuitively, I'm inclined to just believe Gregory that like there's tension there about Jaime. Um, but whereas we hear or Gregory reports hearing uh, Uziel have sex with this sort of litany of women that come through the home uh, with him. We don't really hear about their romantic relationship. We hear Uziel and Jame, we hear about an intimacy between them and we get reports of the intimacy. It's entirely possible that the reason Culver's mad at Jaume, or mad at Uziel about Jaume is because Uziel became a good friend and was like, yeah, like this guy punched you in the eye and like put a gun to your head, but he really loves you, right? And because we don't know that, because it's this third party telling the story, um, there's something incomplete about that, but I think we can kind of infer the both the competition and the foil thing. Um, I just want to mention sort of sidelong that the nature of that distant narrator is a heavy reliance on, you know, trust in that narrator about whom we actually know fairly little. Yeah, I, I generally agree with that. Uh, I would, you know, these two characters are too close to each other to be foils. They're both womanizers of different sorts. I think the difference being Culver uses his affluence to kind of wine and dine these women, whereas Uziel uses his looks and abilities and youth to do the same. Uh, as far as how they love Jaume, I guess, you know, Culver is the same. Like he, he, except that he tries to protect her as much as possible. Uh, he's trying to keep her away from her boyfriend. Uh, he's trying to keep her away from Uziel. Um, part of that is having Gregory watch the kids. Uh, he doesn't want Uziel getting close to her because he likes her. And on the other hand, I think Uziel is trying to have experiences with Jaume and take her out into the world, uh, such as on a boating trip with the kids. Um, and he listens to her more than Culver does, who kind of just tells her like what to do and and or like what things are. Whereas Uziel is more compassionate and empathetic uh, and listens. So I think those are the the main differences that I see. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, they're kind of set up in a way that kind of positions them, I guess, for comparison. Um, but I, I, I completely agree that they're they're too similar to be traditional foils. And in fact, um, you know, assessing out those differences, especially since they come through um, the narrator, um, is a little difficult. Um, we, we're not privy to, you know, what what exactly it is that bonds Zio and Xiaomei. Um, we mainly see them as the narrator um, 
observes them and chooses to see them. Um, so I, I, I was a bit of a Salinger junkie for, for a while. And I think um, I can't help feeling like this story in many ways came out of Salinger's overcoat. Mm. Um, and I think that's part of why this quote came up for me. Um, the Gatcher on the Rye isn't at all the Salinger that this story most reminds me of, but um, and there's this quote that stayed with me through the years, and it's Holden um, at the beginning of the book, and he's talking about books. He says, what really knocks me out about, what, sorry, what really knocks me out is a book that when you're all done reading it, you wish the author that wrote it was a terrific friend of yours and you could call him up on the phone whenever you felt like it. That doesn't happen much though. And um, you know, this is a reference to specific actually published books. Um, I'll let you look up what those are. Um, but, you know, I, I think writers put more and less of themselves on the page. Um, and unless you know an author personally, it's, it's more a character and narrative style um, a voice we hear that we'd like to call up than it is the actual author. Um, but I, I find this thought of Holden's kind of telling, that's why it stuck with me. And um, I know what he means immediately. I think there are different kinds of conversations I'd imagine having with writers, um, which you know I could go on about. <laughs> I could tell you about how I would talk to St. Bald and mm. how I would talk to Emily Dickinson. Um, but I'll I'll try to keep my focus here. Um, there's a quality this story has, and um, I think it has something to do with the intimacy of the characterization, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this one. Um, that gives me that this is an author I could call feeling, um, which leads me to a broad question that isn't really about this exactly, but... Um, how would you describe the characterization and what what works well about it, do you think? You mean the characterization of Gregory or you mean the characterization in general throughout the story? Um, I mean the characterization in general. Yeah. Um, but feel free to open up about the writer thing and the narrator thing too. Yeah, no, I think that there's something really lovely about I do want to get to know this narrator. I think also I'm interested in knowing the mind who writes this particular narrator. Um, and some of that has to do with the tension between the formality of the language and the intelligence of the assessment. Um, I think it, it takes a very special mind to say something like, Right. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from later in the story, page 233. This too was his idea. You apply to the camp with slides and writing samples and to be admitted, you have only to be between 12 and 17 years old and very weird. A freak to use Armand's favorite word. Armand lost his sister and mother to suicide young and of course, AIDS has taken its toll. His zeal is of the art is salvation variety. Um, there's something really, end quote, uh, there's something really uh, so specific. There's so much information packed into that little space. And Armand is a character that sort of appears at the end of the story to help us understand what the new Pocahontas might be or what the new Pocahontas is, Pocahontas being a reference to where Gregory has grown up. Um, but I think there's something sort of witty and a little biting about his zeal is of the art is salvation variety um, that, that goes beyond just sass or like, um, you know, glibness and I I'm interested in that person and I'm interested in the writer who is aware enough to observe that person and in that way I think sort of leading in that way Ingrid with uh your Holden Caulfield from uh Catcher in the Rye quote is um 
is really savvy in that what we get here is a a writer who's writing a narrator and that narrator is observing people in these not exactly journalistic but very heavily observational ways that are at once in the journalistic sense, dropping a lot of information that we need as backstory to understand, right? We're, um, we're recording this just after, right? Um, Solomon Rushdie got stabbed. And um, I've been thinking about that a lot, right? And I've been reading a lot of articles about that situation. And often the articles will say, Salman Rushdie was stabbed and these are the details about it. This is why Salman Rushdie is important and all this stuff about a fat wad and so on and so forth. Right? Um, it has that kind of effect, right? This is the person, here's Stone introducing himself as Stone and here's a bunch of little details about Stone. Um, once those details are laid out on the page, um, the narrator frees himself to then tell us about the interactions with Stone, right? To tell us about the interactions with Xiao Mei. Um, and once in a while, we come back to those new details and those new observations, right? About, I wish I could find this. I've been looking for it for a while where he see, the narrator sees Uziel with his bike and He's actually thinking about through these ideas of Xiao Mei and Uziel, but I think he describes Uziel as irresistible. Um, and right, once we know who Uziel is, once that's laid out, we get that, that little moment says so much about the charisma that draws Xiao Mei to Uziel. It says so much about the sort of tension of the narrator. It says so much about just the image of Uziel and in, in a, you know, Ingrid, you've often described to me the appeal of Hemingway in many ways being the choice to say tree lets the reader imagine the space a little bit as they would imagine the space. The sort of hyper specificity of this story, which is very true of a kind of Salinger thing right, there's almost postmodern specificity of that coming out of the Hemingway tradition. It also leaves so much to the imagination um, so that Uziel is whoever is the sexiest bodybuilding Greek on earth to you in their mid twenties. And, and there's something really um, marvelous about the way in which the contrast of those specifics um, with enough room for dreaming allows you to, to have that fantasy. And I think that's true of most of the characters throughout the story, um, except maybe to Matthew's point, because there's so much exposition, um, when we get the dialogue, there's, there's something really profound about the way we encounter the dialogue, which is its own separate thing. But I think Matthew has some things to say about that. So I'm going to leave room for him to say it. I mean, I don't know if I have anything specific about uh, the dialogue, but, you know, I, I, I definitely think I have, I have a love-hate relationship with wanting to call the author on this. And I only say that to make it sound like the two polar opposites. <laughs> and, and, and the reason is, I, I think I would get the story and all the details possible from the story, but it would take so damn long to get them that I would be constantly interrupting. But I'd feel bad about interrupting because it's such a formal uh, exchange, seemingly based on like, what the narrator sounds like here dear goodness god dear goodness that. god indeed <laughs> <laughs> and like you know maybe you know i'm not cultured enough or or or, or whatever but it it is you know 
just thinking about Victorian homes is like difficult for me. And so far as like every time I feel I go in one, I have to act like a very certain way. <laughs> and I'm like, damn it. Now I got to put on like two masks, you know, like one, you know, to calm me down and one to give an outward appearance of someone else who I am not. And so that doesn't mean <clears throat> that the writer doesn't have something to say. Clearly, I would talk to just about any writer uh, because I think writing is so fascinating. I just am maybe going beyond that step and imagining how the conversation might go. I also might be conflating the narrator and the writer. And, you know, it's hard for me to know, <clears throat> excuse me, where that line is because I don't know the writer really. Um, but yeah, I, I think to Adam's point, you know, so much is, so much insight is given through the exposition. And we find out about these characters through things like that. And so like the irresistible part uh, that Adam brought up combined with the AIDS that Adam brought up combined with the writing and how this information is given to the reader uh, combined with the no children combined with the fact that Stone is surprised that the narrator is not dead because of how he talks, which is a brilliant, brilliant point in this story to me, right? Because it says so much <laughs> about the narrator. That is one of, this, one of the spots where the dialogue really just like hits it, right? Um, but like, here's an example through exposition of learning about a character. And this is about Xiao Mei. And this is when she's at the dinner party and keeps talking about how Daisy has a big crush on Gregory. Uh, Daisy became embarrassed. I know I was too. And the more embarrassed she became, the more Xiao Mei repeated that Daisy had a big crush on me, adding that I was the love of her life and so on. Xiao Mei even told me that if I waited a few years, she would marry Daisy to me. Daisy blushed and deflected her mother's remarks. In all likelihood, I blushed too, all the while pondering whether this line of talk by Zhao Mei was part of some coded ritual that she was going with, that she had going with Uziel. Perhaps I was being oversensitive. But as I say, Zhao Mei continued speaking this way for some time, telling us how fast her American daughter was growing up and how much Daisy liked to wear lipstick and sexy clothes and attract men. And I thought I could see from the faces around the table that the others, including Stone, wished she would stop too. There was a ferocity that came out in her, pushing, pushing. You could practically see her in the ring with a spirit. No one knew what to say to her. Her laughter came in attacks. Right, so we learn a lot about Zhao Mei here and about her past. We, we learn in the story that she became a nurse to come to the United States in the first place from Taiwan, and that she had an uncle living in San Francisco, I think. But the uncle kicks her out after a week, and so she has to make it on her own. And I think, you know, that's, that's like boiling up here. That's one of the things. Uh, she's also in, a, in an abusive relationship. And clearly because she lets uh, her boyfriend back in, uh, right? She, she knows what kind of feelings perhaps Daisy has for the narrator at this point, right? And she's kind of thinking about her life and Daisy's life and the similarities and differences and how Daisy has a chance but her joke about marrying her off to Gregory is such that she does wield the power in this situation and she's joking about it because she really can't do that. So it says so much about that. And then, you know, we also learn a lot about Gregory 
why is Gregory embarrassed that Daisy has a crush on him? You know, it's very strange right there. And that's another thing, another reason I would point to the fact that he's homosexual. Like, he's embarrassed that he doesn't have, like, that they're calling him on liking a woman. Yeah. Um, we're and, calling him on being, right, in, an indirect slight on the impossibility of the situation. Right. Um, yeah, I think all that's really interesting. And I also, to add to that, you're reminding me in the context of some of that sharing, right? When we first see Xiaomei, I think Gregory describes her as possibly Northern Chinese or something, right? Like this is that odd uh, specificity, which is both in time, right? It's remembered, but in time, in the progression, um, but also just fucking wrong. She's from Taiwan. Right. And right, there's something really fascinatingly telling about the the characters through those slips as well and the ways in which that turns like that right like we don't quite get why the guess or why you would know northern china as opposed to any other part part of china we don't quite know why gregory's embarrassed what we do get is something about the off-kilterness of the situation that i think you're hitting on really yeah um savvily. Is that a word, sadly? We'll go with it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we've gotten into all of this. Um, I, I kind of feel like we kind of continued to answer one of my early questions. It's important to me because I've spent a lot of time with the whole of this collection. Um, and this story is by far, um, you know, I mean, for lack of a better word, like the fanciest, um, <laughs> you know, it has like Victorian houses, um, foods I've never heard of. Um, it's like, even though this narrator is from Iowa, like, there's a little bit of an uppityness about it. Um, <laughs> he, he hasn't gotten that Iowa lesson. Um, and, you know, I, I think one thing that I love about the collection as a whole is I feel like I could pick out multiple stories for people based on their reading tastes within it. And there's kind of something for everyone like Matthew, like I would give you the kind of luxuries we felt we deserved, Rogers Square Dance Bar, bar Mitzvah, and A Certain Light on Los Angeles. Adam, I would give to you The White Spot, um, I should have, believe me, all this the way I'm doing it right now. Um, <laughs> New Pocahontas and probably panels. I would only give me dignity shores. Um, <laughs> it's, it's too depressing for the two of you. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, I mean, I think I think the voice in this story is is really, really strong and chatty. Um, I think that's the word that I didn't come up with before that I really associate with Salinger. Like, it's a little gossipy almost. And Adam, like the way you describe kind of putting the facts out there, but then letting the action speak um, is I think so apt. I, I didn't think of that, but that absolutely is a thing that happens. Like characters get described in terms of like their age and I don't know, almost not generic descriptions, but describing as in, in a way that's a little more static maybe. And then we get the animated version. Um, but anyway, I think even though this, this story is one where the characters are few, um, I, I think you two both did wonderfully kind of describing how that characterization happens and what's, what's so interesting about it. Um, we've gotten into this a little maybe, um, but I, I'm wondering for you, like where does the story's plot um, have the most narrative heat and what moments and conflicts um, do you get interested in why? And, and why? Well, I mean, mine is very clearly Stone. I love Stone. <laughs> stone <laughs> is crazy. 
I mean, he's only six, you know, but uh, he runs around, he airplanes around, he's destroying plants and flowers, he's kicking people. <laughs> like, it's the perfect response that I would have when I was six in a situation like this. <laughs> but I also love Daisy because Daisy is like the complete opposite of Stone. Yeah. So my answer is the kids. Um, and da But Daisy's like a very like proper, like let's sit down and have a talk uh, as if it were tea time. Um, and she actually builds a relationship with Gregory. And perhaps uh, my favorite part is when uh, Gregory and Daisy talk about the circus that, that uh, he went to when he was a little, when he was seven. Uh, it would be like the one time of year his mother would buy new clothes for all the, her kids. So he'd have a new set of clothes with his sisters. Uh, and then the sisters would always like talk up the circus as if this year there were going to be like new things at the circus and all these wonderful you know, new attractions, but it'd always be like clowns and stinking animals, uh, according to Gregory. And, you know, they, they talk about, uh, here we go. I found it. Uh, here's Gregory talking to Daisy. The monkeys stank. The elephants sloshed up dirt and manure. When the elephants tromped around in a circle, little patties of brown stuff flew up onto our new collars and sometimes in our mouths. I left that town as soon as I could and never looked back. There's a lot to do in LA, Daisy said. You should try it. Yes, I know, remember? I've lived there too, right? So it's, it's again, right? Like Daisy's coming from the background of living in LA and Gregory from Iowa, Nowheresville, Iowa. And so we learn a lot about their upbringings and, and, and what is interesting to them. But more than that, I think the kids give a break to the plot that is necessary in the story, especially with the amount of detail that takes place in the exposition. And, you know, the part that I was just kind of uh, reading from is a longer conversation between Daisy and Gregory that I think really breaks up the story uh, expositionally and infuses some life into Gregory as the narrator. We actually get to hear him talk through dialogue instead of simply exposition. And so I think that's where the narrative heat was the strongest for me. Yeah. Um... The narrative heat shifted for me on different readings of this story. Uh, I don't disagree with Matt. I know you like disagree on where you feel narrative heat, right? <laughs> um, but uh, first reading of this story, the kids had so much heat, right? Like there's something weird about like, I mean, maybe because like it, in the time period of this story, it wasn't weird for me to just like hang out with random adults. But in my like 30s, I look at kids hanging out with random adults and I'm like, Jesus Christ, don't be a low leader situation. And then like it turned into not that at all, but a really lovely uh, to Esme with love and squalor situation instead, but with younger children. Um, and right, like, of course, Jaume's like the kind of mystery of Jaume's situation leading into her murder is really mortifying on that first read. Um, and I kept wondering about the dead mother and if we were going to get to like the details there. And then I realized, I read this story again last night and then I was like wandering around today and thinking to myself about all of that. And I, it might seem like Matthew and I have gotten preoccupied with Gregory's sexual orientation and with the time period in which this story happens. But I think um, one thing that like this story threw me back to was actually Michael Cunningham's home at the end of the world, like the end of it in particular, 
right? There's something very aftermath of AIDS about this situation, right? Which if you sort of pin the like, we can argue about whether or not Mariah Carey like is relevant into like the modern world or whether or not uh, Ice Cube is, but like Arsenio Hall in particular, right? Like we're right at the end of like the major part of the AIDS crisis. Um, the narrator's coming out of San Francisco and whether or not he's gay or the Bay Area anyway, if he's just like leaving Berkeley, um, whether or not he's gay, right? There's a massive uh, proportion of that community that like passes away during that time. And maybe I'm like overly attuned to that and overly sensitive to it because so many of the people who are important in my life have been like boomer aged gay men who like passed in or through San Francisco in the Bay at that time. But there's, there's something, everyone in this house is sort of a refugee in some ways, right? Um, and looking for something like uh, a new place to feel at home. And uh, I don't know, I was walking around thinking about that today and it, like that ending became more and more relevant. And right, like the ending is weird. We actually like end up with the narrator. We don't learn that the narrator is into like, pottery or clay making, but he like gets involved with this crowd of artists who are, and they make their own giant, what is it, dragon back kiln um, um, built into the side of a mountain. And they all sort of have this little like weird, maybe not cult, but like community. And they're like keeping the kiln fired at all times of day and sleeping out next to it. Or, and Right, like there's something about that as a both a, a ritual, but also as a, a creative act and as a means by which to connect to and be part of each other's lives in family in a in this this profound way. And that throws me back on what the story is sort of about, right? Like the ephemerality of this Victorian house, the impossibility of making the the family sort of out of whole cloth in the random events um and then the need to rebuild Pocahontas Iowa which even in 2022 remains a very strange little joint um uh I don't know I think in that way right like in in the end the end is what holds the narrative heat for me because it throws me back on um, why this person is so fixated on what was unsustainable about this appealing Victorian picturesque space that he'd imagined himself into with the declaration of having to live there. Well, goodness, um, well put both of you. Um, the narrator uses the word goodness multiple times and not just, you know, <laughs> coming up with goodness. Um, and, you know, I think and for me over multiple readings and all of those moments um, really sung for me. I think um, Bloom does a fabulous job with the children. Um, and, you know, I think they're the details about them, even when they're just descriptive, just um, feel so much like kids. Um, you know, Daisy with her all pink or all yellow outfits. <laughs> it's, it's just so right. Um, and, you know, I think the things that sit in the background of this story um, make it one that I, I want to reread and reread. I, I, like you, Adam, I hadn't paid much attention to, um, you know, the one line where AIDS gets mentioned um, or, or that much attention to the time period. It, it's there, we, like Matthew mentioned, we have Beauty in the Beast and things that we can mark time by, but, um, you know, it doesn't feel essential to the story, but there is this whole other story that lives there in the background. And 
I guess for me, that feels really right to the way that, you know, I sometimes mark time myself. I'll, I'll be aware of, you know, a relative passing away or what's going on with a relative who's troubled. Um, but that may not be the story I'm telling, but it's so big for me that it would be a marker. Um, I suppose a movie coming out or, um, you know, a crisis is as serious and global as the AIDS crisis. Um, so, you know, all those things draw me to. Um, uh, to conclude, I, I discovered Jonathan Borman's work as I had many writers through Michael Silverblatt and his, his bookworm program. Um, he has an interview with Jonathan Borman about the, unus the usual uncertainties. Um, and Silver Blatt notes that his stories prove that life is strange, that what a story doesn't do is tell you what you already know. It's strange about this. And my question is, um, what's strange about this story? Um, what's Silver Blatt talking about? And I guess looking particularly at the ceramic artists and where this story takes us, because Adam, you're so right. Um, I, I don't expect the ending <laughs> at all, um, but it feels so perfect and so intriguing. Yeah, I think for me it's that this story has a hyper reality that makes it feel in the course of reading uh, unreal um, or surreal, sometimes not exactly dreamlike, but almost like it doesn't quite fit together um, but there is, right, like there's too much packed in or something, but then it might, um, it, I think life actually kind of feels that way sometimes, right? Like there's a little thing that happens at the end, right? Where the narrator is living with these folks who do this anagama technique of, you know, firing clay and Right, there's some kind of coming together of his family again out of Pocahontas, right? And into this new space, right? Um, I have brought my homely sister, Emily from Davenport and her born again husband, Bruce to see a firing and they too are astonished. Their oldest daughter, Kara, now a bookish adolescent scholar of a Nagama technique, um, so on and so forth, right? Um, Davenport's a, a town in Iowa. Um, a bit bigger than Pocahontas. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Um, but I, I think it's so, right, like it's not a story that like wraps itself up in little bows. It's a story that has these threads that tie back and tell us something about a narrator's deep and complex emotional world that involves um, disturbance, if not trauma. And it does that without showing us the trauma directly or, but rather through the, the nuances of what's ultimately mostly everyday life with um, the hard and offstage punctuation of what happens to Xiao Meng and the hard and offstage punctuation of what happens to the mother and the hard and offstage punctuation of what happens to um, any of those other people in Gregory's life that are absent. And um, that angularity, that like sort of Tarkovskian lens on the thing is really very cool and kaleidoscopic um, and you can turn the kaleidoscope back to uh, a looking glass but I'm not sure you'd want to. Uh, I think for me the strangest thing about the story is not the end but the narrator and the way the narrator speaks. I think the end makes a lot of sense based on the 
household at the Victorian house. And, you know, as I mentioned, like early on, I think the narrator's looking for what to do in life, who to be in life, and is finally figuring out that he wants to have experiences of various sorts with various types of people. And perhaps this ceramic group is finally the one that is most like what he's looking for. Uh, I do, I do think I might take slight umbrage with, uh, stories prove that life is strange, that what a story doesn't do is tell you what you already know. And I only say that because one thing that has fascinated me about stories is telling me something I know in a way that I hadn't thought of before, that I think is really profound. And it's something I knew, but, it's, but I hadn't thought about it deeply enough to come to a conclusion, but some other writer has. I find that really astounding. And that's not to say that I disagree with that statement completely, uh, that what a story doesn't do is tell you what you already know, because, you know, stories are definitely using what you know to tell their stories. I just wanted to point out that fact that I think that is another thing that is useful and important in stories. Um, and I, I think maybe the thing that the ending does do or does point out in more clear terms is that it's it's strange and isn't it strange that people really want to find a group to fit into because it gives them some sort of form and milieu in which to operate and live. Uh, insofar as like what Adam just read about uh, the narrator's sisters, Emily, her husband, Bruce, is a born again, right? Christian. Like that's, he does that presumably because of Emily. But it makes him feel better, right? Same with the narrator finding the ceramic group, right? Whatever it is about the people and the repetition and the oddity of trying to glaze something and doing it imperfectly, right? Like those are the things that are speaking to the narrator. And so in the end, right? I keep thinking of Pocahontas in, in the historical sense, right? Mm. But this story is telling us, I think, it's not your relationship to uh, popular or, 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 you know, popular celebrities. It's your relationship to the everyday mundane people and what they do and what happens to them. And that's why he remembers these kids in Jaume and Uzil and, and Culver, because those, those are the stories you tell other people that have more resonant meaning than it is meeting some personality. That's where you learn about life. Um, well, I, I'm so glad you, you brought that up, my, uh, Matthew, about the Michael Silverblatt quote. And, you know, I think tr true that um, sometimes stories do tell you this, this thing you already know um, that you just couldn't have articulated in that way, but you sort of feel like when the author has written it, it's, it's actually your words. Um, if you had only thought about it a little more, so you understand it so deeply and um, you know, I, 
on that note, th thank you both so much for thinking so deeply about this story and for giving it the care and space it deserves. Thanks, Ingrid. Thank you for bringing it to us. Mm -hmm.